Okay, so I declare that we have finished with fermions, and at least for now. And what I want to do today is three different things. I want to first do a quick and dirty quantization of the electromagnetic field, then do the interaction picture fast, and then do a Feynman diagram in the simplest case slowly. And then you should see that you should have an understanding of what Feynman diagrams are. Okay, so let's do electrodynamics first. In this department, because of the concentration in optics and quantum information theory, it's certainly permissible to do QED quickly, so that's what I'm going to do. The action is a half an integral of P squared minus P squared T4 X. I've got, of course, H1 is equal to 1. This can be written as F mu nu is F mu nu T4 X, where I'm using the Peston shorter notation, P mu A nu minus T mu A mu. There are, of course, four conventions for this, depending on your metric, and depending on whether F mu nu is mu nu or mu nu. Four different conventions makes life very difficult. EI, it turns out, is FI zero, and epsilon IJK BK is minus FIJ, but I don't think, I'm not going to actually use that at the moment. I'll use another expression later. J, JA, let's say, or J mu, if you want, is the charge density times the current density. And, in fact, if we, this is just the field part. The actual action has minus a quarter F mu nu, F mu nu, plus A mu, J mu, T4 X, where J mu is some conserved current, zero is T mu, J mu. Is that like the source term? You can use it as, you can say it's a source term. You can say it's a source term. In fact, this can be a classical current. But it could also be, if we're doing full-blown QED, it could also be psi bar D slash, no, psi bar, psi bar gamma mu psi times E. So J could be something like that. And it is in QED where you have the fermions as well as the electromagnetic field quantized. And, of course, you also have to have the kinetic action for the something like I D slash N psi. I may have the psi wrong. So the full-blown action of QED is the electromagnetic part plus this term plus the kinetic energy, the kinetic term for the fermions. And, of course, the A mu multiplies this, although the gamma mu would be lower because this would be lower than this. Yeah. Is that second term gauge invariant? Brilliant question. The thing that's gauge invariant is psi bar 
D-U-M-U with, I guess, an I plus an sign, where D-U is the ordinary derivative, plus or minus, and since I didn't intend to talk about this today, I can't get the signs right, I-D-A-U. That's speaking here. And the sum of what I had intended here was that A-U, in other words, this thing is A-U, E, Psi, R, Gamma, Mu, Psi, plus the kinetic term is this, and that's speaking here. But at the moment, I just want to say that this is a conserved current, and then this thing will be gauging here. Although the gauge invariance of this part is smaller than the gauge invariance of that part, because the gauge invariance over here is Psi prime is E to the I theta of X, Psi of X, and then A-U prime of X is A-U, and again, it's something like plus or minus E times the derivative of theta of X. So this is the full-blown gauge transformation, and the whole of QED is invariant under that, where this is a local symmetry, which is local gauge invariance. But I don't want to go off on too many tangents, or I'm going to get through what I meant to say today. Well, as you saw in one of the homework problems, the Lagrange density here is, you write it this way, minus a quarter F mu nu, and then you just write this as E mu nu minus E mu nu minus G mu nu. Hold on, I've got plus in one place and minus in the other place, so there's clearly a typo here. Let's see, next question. Then you have D mu of the partial of the Lagrangian with respect to D mu A nu. This is clearly minus D mu of D mu A nu minus D mu A nu, and this is equal to partial L partial A nu. I picked this up from my desk without looking carefully at it. I hope this is the de-typoed version of my notes. Yeah, I think it is. We'll see in a moment. Otherwise, I'll have to get the notes. Okay, so with the minus sign there, then that is minus J nu. Yeah, this looks like the de-typoed version. So this then should be a minus sign. And so what we have then is D mu F mu nu is J nu. You set nu equal to zero, and you have D I F I zero is J zero rho, and this is Gauss's law, divergence of E is rho. And this, you know, is a constraint. And that's one of the things that's characteristic of gauge theory is that there are constraints in the theory. Okay, you set nu equal to K, and you get D mu of D mu A K minus D J A mu equal to J K. And puzzling that out, you get minus D zero D K minus D J D J A K minus D K D J equals J K. And this is curl of D minus E dot equals J. So that's the second of the inhomogeneous Maxwell equations. Inhomogeneous meaning you've got a 
you've got something besides the fields in the equation. Now, B is del cross A, which is to say BI is epsilon IJK, DJ, AK. By the way, the thing that is, when you're confused about signs, and you might be trying to go from a Weinberg metric to a Peskin metric, or vice versa, DJ is always positive. That is to say, it's the derivative with respect to time and space. Peskin and Weinberg agree on what that is. Similarly, raise all the indices on a vector, that's always positive, and it's the same in both metrics. That's just a way of dealing with it. Okay, so since the B is the curl of A, it's obvious that the divergence of B is zero, and that's another of Maxwell's equations. This is actually part of a more general identity, epsilon L IJK. That's a four-component, totally anti-symmetric tensor. BI, DJ, AK is zero. It's zero because I and J are anti-symmetric here and symmetric here, so the thing is zero. You subtract one from the other, and you get epsilon L IJK, BI, DJ, AK minus DK and J equals zero. So this is just I'm subtracting zero from zero, and what this gives, this actually gives delta B equals zero or L equals zero, and it gives curl of B plus B dot equals zero or L not equals zero. Okay, so those are all the Maxwell equations. Under this gauge transformation, F mu nu prime is D mu A nu plus D nu lambda minus D nu A mu plus D mu lambda. Well, I'm using lambda as E theta. It's just some scalar. The D mu, D nu lambda cancels the minus D nu, D mu lambda, and so this is equal to F mu nu. So this is just the standard gauge invariance of the Maxwell tensor, and you notice if you make a gauge transformation on S, this is invariant, but this changes to minus A mu plus D mu lambda J mu, but if the current is conserved, you can integrate by parts, and you get lambda minus lambda D mu J mu, but that's equal to zero, and of course, as usual, I'm ignoring the surface terms because despite the stimulus funding and infinity is still scalar. All right, so far we've been, is there a question? I mean, do you really have to integrate by parts here, or isn't it just this thing is zero? Well, no, because here it's not zero because it's D mu lambda times J mu, so you have to integrate by parts. Oh, I see, to get rid of the A. Sorry. That's okay. Okay, now, the, any other questions? All right, so now, the physical gauge, all of which for QED is the radiation gauge, also called the Coulomb gauge, and it's defined by del dot A equal to zero. A lot of books say a lot of nonsense about QED, and in particular, some books actually use something called the gulf of Euler formalism. Don't go there. It's just intellectual quicksand. 
So what, uh, how do you go to this gauge? What you do is you arrange that you want del dot A prime to be zero, so that is the del dot A plus um, uh, grad lambda, say, is zero. In other words, you make a gauge transformation on A, and the, the three part of A does that. If you want this to vanish, then what you have is minus Laplacian of lambda has to equal um, the divergence of the A that you started with, and you, you, you um, solve that equation, and it's basically lambda of x is 1 over 4 pi integral dq y uh, delta A of y over x minus y. And uh, that choice of lambda then gives you uh, an A prime that, uh, so then the divergence of A prime which is the divergence of A plus that lambda actually vanishes. So this is the A prime, that, this is the A that we use, and then we drop the prime. So that's how you go to Coulomb gauge. Um, why, why was that less than necessary? Dropping the prime? No, I mean, why not just use A? Why, why do we have to Oh, because A, if you start with A, it's not necessarily, doesn't, it doesn't necessarily have di uh, zero divergence. What I'm saying, if you start with any old gauge field, mm -hmm. and you, you can always make a gauge transformation so the divergence of A vanishes. That's what I'm saying. Okay. You're just enforcing the condition in A itself, right? A has some divergence. We make a gauge transformation to A prime, which has no divergence. So. And then we drop the prime because we don't want to carry it along. All right. Now we're in Coulomb gauge. We're in Coulomb gauge. So now we look at Gauss's law again, which is di at line zero, which is di, di, a zero minus d zero, a pi. Right. Okay. This second term vanishes because di, ai is zero. That's the divergence of a. So this is just, and then, this D with an upper I in the Peskin metric has a minus sign. So this is minus del squared D zero. But this thing equals rho by Gauss's law, which is del dot E. So you have the equation minus del squared A zero is rho, and you solve that A zero of X then is one over four pi. Integral rho or J zero Y Y over In this way, you remove A0 from the theory. So we no longer have A0. We just have rho or J0. And in this integral, X0 equals Y0. So it looks as though we're violating relativity, but in fact, it's fine. This means that uh, in, in, we have minus J0, A0, which in Peston metric is minus J0, A0 uh, in L. So we have in H a term H rho, which is an integral J0, A0, dq x, because the Hamiltonian has a minus, 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 has plus potential of action, has minus. And so inside here we've got a row of x, row of y over 4 pi, x minus y, d cubed x, d cubed y. So this is part of the Hamiltonian. This row is close to 0. And um, so what do we have left? The only thing we have left then is the three part of A but subject to the condition del dot a equals zero. And so that means we only have two degrees of freedom left. But this, the Hamiltonian with the subscript is what, a particular part of the Hamiltonian? I don't want to get yes, 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 it. Yes, yes, yes. I don't want to get it. 
All right. Yes, it's just a particular part of the number. All right. Okay, a mu of x. So now I'm quantizing the thing either from experience or from this derivation. What we've got then is since del dot a is zero, we can only have two kinds of particles. And as you know, photons are massless, and so their angular momentum can only be in the direction of motion or opposite the direction of motion, the spin, I mean. And so... Well, why is the divergence state being zero, telling me I only have two types of particles? Well, we've got essentially if del dot a were not zero, then each of the three components could be thought of as a different kind of particle. There would be three fields here. So there's only two independent components of a. That's right. Okay. That's right. And... Did you choose del dot a to be zero? What? That was just a gauge choice, right? That was a gauge choice. In any gauge, we should get the same result. I mean, we should get... Yes, yes. So it thereby hangs a lot of stuff that I... I don't want to go... We went into the weeds for the spinner stuff, and I think that's okay. But we can't go into the weeds on everything, or we'll... Well, what's the lesson that we're avoiding? I mean, there's always going to be two independent components, because there's always going to be some choice of fixing the gauge, right? Right. There are various different... There's different popular gauges, and there's a continuous infinity of actual gauges. And you have to... If you quantize in one gauge, then you're in that gauge forever. Okay. But what... Is there any way to quantize without fixing the gauge? All right. There is a... There are half-integral methods, which I'm happy to do later in the semester. But... And, in fact, in lattice gauge theory, it's perfectly appropriate. In fact, it's conventional to not fix the gauge at all and just integrate over all gauges. In that way, what you have is a ratio of half-integrals. So you've got extra integrals in the numerator, extra integrals in the denominator, and they cancel. Anyway, meanwhile, back at the ranch. When I was a little boy, I sometimes listened to the radio. There was a radio program in New York City. Every 15 minutes, they'd say, meanwhile, back at the ranch. Anyway, DQP, 2 pi Q. This is, again, Heston-Schroeder notation. 2P0. Sum on S from, say, minus 1 to 1. E to the minus I, PX. EU of P and S. A of P and S. So I'm sort of mixing the Weinberg and... In Heston-Schroeder, P and S are subscripts. In this term, I'll use them as subscripts. So EU star sub PS. A dagger sub PS. Okay. How did we figure out the spin was 1? We're starting from minus 1 to 1. Well, it's... Okay, you're absolutely right. It's a vector field. And we could go through the same business that we did for the spinners. Remember, we'd say... Sorry, the same kind. What actually is... I mean, if we had... If we went into the weeds for the spin 1 case, then we'd have... I wish I had my notes with me, but it's... That's right. We'd have something like this. Something like DJ on a spinner U equals U and then a D of R inverse. I think I've actually written it backwards. I think it's the other way around. But anyway, we'd have that, and then we'd apply Schur's lemma. And then we know that 
because this thing was a four vector, okay, because because it was a four vector, this is a representation with spin one, and that would fix j equal to one, and then we we go that way. And but then there'd be a part that would be the scalar, namely the a zero part. But that's the part I'm throwing away. Anyway, be, be, I'm not doing things in as much detail as with fermions, so you you can't you can't expect to understand everything. In, <laughs> you know, in I can't derive everything from 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 the egg without going back into the weeds, and then we'd be two weeks and not two weeks, but a week in the weeds. So. I, I I don't know. I mean, if you guys want, I'll you know. Go it seems ahead. a little whirlwind right now. Excuse me. It seems a little little quick. Right. I don't want to throw a wrench in your, in your plan. So let's find the diagram and stuff. So. Right. All right. Well, let's let's. I mean, you guys have seen the quantization of electromagnetic field in other courses, haven't you? Uh, I mean, we do do quantum objects in this department. Some people did. So we just kind of <laughs> be kind of. There were no details of that. Yeah, the quantum optics supposed to say four details take a quantum yeah, field theory class. <laughs> <laughs> well, look. I mean, if you guys want want the the whole nine yards, I'm happy to you know come back on Monday and. With, with the other eight yards. <laughs> um, why don't you all think about it, and before the class is over, tell me, and I'm happy to do it either way. The fact is, however, that although Weinberg in general starts from first principles and builds everything up logically, it seems to me that in the spin zero, spin in the massless fields case, he did a marvelous job, better than anybody else. But I think that there were some, still some mystery there, mm -hmm. which is of course interesting. I mean, the, the thing that's interesting about physics is that there were mysteries, and um, so. All right. Well, anyway, think about it. But let me let me just go on with this because I haven't finished what these E mu's are. Obviously, we want P dot E to vanish because if you take if you, you look just at the three vector part of this, take the divergence, you'll pull down a three p vector dotted into an e, and you want that to be zero. Okay. So this gives L dot a zero. Moreover, we want e zero equal to zero because. A0 is gone. In other words, A0 was replaced by an integral over the charge, and that went into the Hamiltonian, and so that, that that's just gone. And um, the index A labels the the uh, two spin states, which are J dot P hat equal to plus or minus one because the particles are massless and in Peston Schroeder notation, or in fact, I'm really going to use Peston Schroeder notation, then A dagger P prime S prime commutator is delta S S prime delta Q P minus P prime to R Q. And of course, A P S. AP prime S prime commutator Okay, so now everything's quantized. Um, but I haven't said enough about the E's. What's a reasonable choice of the E's? If P, if P equal to length of P Z hat, we can set E equal to 1 over root 2 x hat plus or minus i y hat, and this is e of 
Let me give you a moment to get this. E of PZ hat plus or minus 1 equals this. So these are the two polarization vectors that are circularly polarized. Y, and then for an arbitrary P, plus or minus 1, what we have is a rotation matrix to the vector from the Z axis to the P hat direction on PZ hat plus or minus 1. And we can conventionally take this as minus I, B, J, Z, E to the minus I, theta, J, Y. Okay. And then we have a certain relation, which I may assign as a homework problem. EI of P and S, J star of P and S, summed over P is delta I, J minus P, I, P, J over P vector squared. All right. So that's our, that's our, that's the quantization of the electromagnetic field. I'm not going to go into any more detail about that now. But in another couple of lectures, what I'm going to do is show you that if you take this field and you compute the propagator, which is to say the mean value in the vacuum of the time-ordered product of A mu of X with A nu of Y, you're going to get something with this, these rules, you're going to get something that's a mess. I mean, it's, it looks kind of like the propagator for a scalar field, but it's got a certain amount of algebra in it that reflects the fact that we've chosen the Coulomb gauge. But what actually, what actually happens is when you compute S matrix elements with this propagator and this term in the Hamiltonian, it's the same as if you erase that term in the Hamiltonian and use the very nice propagator that Peskin and Schroeder mentioned in, I guess, their chapter four. In other words, the propagator is just propagator for scale field within the numerator A to mu nu, rather, okay, rather than complicated. All right, but that's enough, that's something for next week. All right, now, now the interaction picture. Just very quickly, all right, first of all, what are we going to call the S matrix? The S matrix is some U infinity minus infinity, or matrix elements of this, where U of T and T0 is E D I H0 T minus I H T minus T0 minus I H0 T0. Here I'm following some pages in Weinberg, and I think this is a street view of this. So, except that he uses Taw and Taw0. He has a fondness for Greek letters that I think is misplaced. Anyway, the U T here is then V of T, U of T and T0. And what's V of T? Well, do the differentiation explicitly, and what you get is E D I H0 T, and then, well, there's an I H0, so that's minus H0. But then you differentiate this term, and you get plus H, and then you have minus I. In fact, let me just say chalk and time, I'm going to write this this way, E to the minus I H T minus T0, E to the minus I H0 T0, and then what we can do is write E to the minus I H0 T E to the 
apply to page 0 and 2. Well, obviously, it's in theory of a Hamiltonian between page 0 and... Right, page 2. Right, 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 right. H equals page 0 plus B. Thank you. You won't choke me. Okay. So, this thing then is V of T, namely E of the I, H0 of T, V, E to the minus I, H0 of T. So, this is V of T. And this is just U of T. So, I've derived this equation. Well, once you have that equation, then it's kind of obvious what the solution is. The solution is U of T and T0 is a time-ordered exponential of minus I integral of T0 to T of V of T prime to T prime. And that's because when you differentiate now with respect to T, you bring down the derivative of the argument of the exponential, but that's just an integral, so that's just minus I V of T, and then the I cancels the minus I, but then you bring it down in such a way as to respect the time ordering, which means it comes out here on the left. And that's just this equation. All right. Is everybody happy with that? Or do you want to see anything more? Another way of seeing this is to say, well, this is... This satisfies the equation 1 minus I integral T0 of T V of T prime U of T prime T0 T T prime. In other words, you convert this differential equation into this integral equation, and then you iterate it. You say, well, if U is this, then I can stick in a 1 here, and so forth, and you get 1 minus I integral V of T prime T T prime, and then minus integral plus minus I squared if you want, and it's T0 to T T0 to T prime T1 if you want, T T1 T T2 V of T1 V of T2 V of T2. So that's plus dot dot dot, but that's just this. Okay, so much for the interaction picture. Why people make such a mystery of that, I don't know. All right. Now, so why did we get going to the interaction picture? Because we're trying to do Feynman diagrams. Okay, that's fine. I just don't know the motivation yet, so it's a little... Yeah, that's right. I haven't been accused of that, of not explaining why we're doing whatever we're doing. The S matrix is matrix elements of this operator. So, for example, suppose we're considering scattering from the state P1 and P2 to the state P1 prime P2 prime, and to avoid some trivial pursuits, let's assume all the four momenta are different. Normally, of course, the case. And let's recall what the PS notation is. In the PS notation, you get a square root of 2 EP, a value of P, vacuum or equivalent of square root of 2 P0, a value of P, vacuum, and PQ is 2 P0, 2 pi Q, 
held to T minus Q. Okay. So the S matrix for this process is T1 prime, T2 prime, U of infinity minus infinity, T1, T2. Okay. Now, let's just notice what that is. This U has these IH0 minus IH0 on the two ends. These states are eigenstates of H0. So this just gives you a minus I infinity P0, 1 plus P0, 2, and it cancels the term out of there. So those things don't have any effect. And then this is just the time evolution operator. So what we actually have then is P1 prime, P2 prime, time order product E to the minus I integral B of T, DT from minus infinity to plus infinity, P1, P2. Now, I'm picking the Hamiltonian so as to avoid some of the combinatoric factors that can drive one, no, not drive one crazy, but that can cause one to pause and think when doing Feynman diagrams. So I'm writing this Hamiltonian density as the Hamiltonian density for the three fields plus a coupling constant, psi dagger psi phi, where these are all spin zero fields. It would be somewhat more complicated if we had real QED with A, U, and psi, and we'll do that later. But I just want to show you how the Feynman diagrams work and, okay. So in other words, this integral of B of T, DT, is actually G integral psi dagger of X, psi of X, phi of X, D fourth X. And remember, psi of X is psi plus of X, the positive frequency part, plus the negative frequency part. And I'm taking psi to be a complex spin zero field. So this is integral D Q P to pi Q root two P zero. And then we have A sub P even minus I P X. This is the psi plus, plus P P dagger, E D I P X. This is psi minus. So what's phi? Am I supposed to know what this type of term is doing? I'm getting, I'll do phi in a second. Let me just do psi dagger for you. Just for clarity, it's the same thing. D Q P, square root two P zero, but now A P dagger, E D I P X, plus P P, E D minus I P X. And so this thing here is psi plus dagger, and this is psi minus dagger. And then phi of X, well, this is just a neutral spinless field, D Q P to pi Q, two P zero. And I'm going to call this C. C sub P is minus I P X plus C dagger P E D I P X. All right. So what's the difference between these psi fields and the phi fields? They're obviously true. They're all spin zero, but this is the particle annihilation operator. You can think of the particle as charged, if you want, say a phi plus. This is the creation operator for the antiparticle, say a phi minus. This creates a phi plus. This annihilates a phi minus. And this annihilates a phi zero, creates a phi zero. That's one way of thinking of it, but it doesn't have to be that way. And because we have to admit the embarrassing thing about quantum field theory is that this is the case that's simple, namely spin zero. We still haven't observed it as an elementary particle in nature, although people at Fermi Lab and 
Kelly and Geneva are hopeful. Okay, so this initial stage is P1, P2, is then squared to P1, 0, 2, P2, 0, A, P1, dagger, B, P2, dagger, on the vacuum. And the final stage, P1 times P2 times, is the same thing, but with primes, effectively, P1 times 0, P2 times 0. And now I'm going to write it backwards, so it's A, P1 times B, P2. So we see how this process is. We know what the process is. A pi plus and a pi minus, for instance. It's pi plus, pi minus, scattering via a pi zero. But I'm not trying to be simple. Give you the essence of Feynman diagrams as opposed to all the weeds. We get into the weeds later. But again, you know, if you have a different Lagrangian, a different Hamiltonian, you have a different set of weeds. And so, all right. So what are we dealing with? Well, I took all the momenta different. And so if we have P1 prime, P2 prime, and we expand this thing, and we imagine, I'm imagining that this coupling constant is small. Of course, pi ions, it's actually big. That's another embarrassment. But let's just imagine that we're talking about a small coupling constant. So I can expand this thing. So I get 1 minus I, G integral, psi dagger psi, pi equals X minus a half G squared integral time ordered product now of psi dagger psi pi, all of X1, psi dagger psi pi, all of X2, D4, X1, D4, X2. And then on the right-hand side is P1, P2. Okay. Well, this term is zero because the initial state and the final state are orthogonal. This term is also zero because there just aren't enough. This operator is quadratic in the pi plus, pi minus operators, or the A and B operators, and two operators isn't enough to change, to annihilate both these particles and create both of those particles. You need four operators. So that term is zero. So what we're down to then is minus a half G squared. And then I'm going to write this as just two P zeros. Okay. In other words, it's all these square roots, the square roots of the initials and the square roots of the final. And then we have zero A P1 prime, B P2 prime, integral time ordered product. And now I'll write it in a little more detail. Psi plus dagger X1. Whoops. Plus psi minus dagger of X1. Psi of X1 plus psi minus X1. Phi X1 times, of course, psi plus dagger of X2 plus psi minus dagger of X2. Psi plus X2 plus psi minus X2. Phi X2. End of time ordering. And then just nothing more than A P1 dagger, B P2 dagger. Okay. So this is what we've got. Now, the only thing that can survive is terms with one psi plus, one psi minus, one psi plus dagger, and one 
sign minus that. That's because the, these two guys, I'm, I'm sorry, these, these two guys will annihilate, are needed to annihilate these two particles. And these two guys are needed to create these two particles. So the only thing that can survive is terms here that involve one of these, one of these, one of these, and one of those. What that means is that instead of 2 times 2 times 2 times 2, which is 16 terms, we actually only have 4. So only 4 terms. So let's look at the 4 terms. That, um, Work and I guess these four terms will look like this. Uh, minus a half g squared, square root of two p zeros. Zero a p one prime b p two prime. Okay, so let me write down these terms explicitly. I'm on the product sine plus tag sine plus x1 phi x1 sine minus data x2 sine minus x2 phi x2 and then of course equal x1 equal x2 so that's one term the next term is integral t sine plus tangent x1 sine minus x1 phi x1 sine minus tangent x2 sine plus x2 phi x2 ditto and to say forward space, plus t sine minus dagger x1 sine plus x1 phi x1 sine plus dagger x2 sine minus x2 phi x2 and then equal x1 x2 and then finally the last term Integral t sine minus dagger x1 sine minus x1 phi x1 sine plus dagger x2 sine plus x2 phi x2 ditto closing bracket a p1 dagger okay so that's it. Now, do you notice something funny about this? In other words, there's something we don't know. If you look at the first term and the fourth term, what you see is that the first term and the fourth term differ just by the interchange of x1 and x2. But x1 and x2 are dummy variables, so they don't care what we call them, and we can interchange them. We just get a factor of two. Similarly, the second and the third term are also the same, except for uh, the interchange of x1 and x2. So what we actually get then, in fact, what I can do then is I can just erase this one half a factor of two, and then I just put a bracket a p one dagger b p two dagger back in, and then I just erase all this. Okay, now, so we have that the amplitude, the scattering amplitude, 
is the sum then of two integrals. The first term, in the first term, what we've got here is an annihilation operator and a creation operator at x1. And this one is the, is the annihilation operator for the A particle. So this is going to annihilate P1 and create, is going to annihilate A P1 dagger and create uh, A dagger P1 beyond that. And on the other hand, um, this first term also, what else does it do? Well, these terms, this one creates the antiparticle at position two and uh, annihilates the incoming uh, antiparticle at position two. Okay. Feynman had a, Feynman represented this by a diagram. And the diagram is this. P1 in, P1 prime out, here is X1, and this is actually a slightly hybrid diagram. Okay, so because we chose to call P1 and P1 prime the momenta of the incoming particle and antiparticle, we have the arrows going up for the particle, down for the antiparticle. The squiggle in between represents what's left, what the phi's are doing, and I'll, we'll see more about that in a minute. The other Time, by the way, is, so I'm thinking of this as a, as a hybrid diagram. Time is going up. You, the, the Feynman diagrams can be thought of a space-time diagram to a momentum diagram. And after one has a certain amount of practice, you forget about the space-time and just do the momentum diagrams. Is there any questions? All right. What about the second term? Well, in the second term, the second term creates both particles. The, creates both the particle and the antiparticle. This creates the particle. This creates the antiparticle at x1. And this one cancels the incoming particles. This cancels the incoming particle, uh, cancels the incoming antiparticle at x1. So this diagram looks like this. So those are the two Feynman diagrams. Now the question is, um, that's the picture. What what are the numbers? All right. So let's look at number one first. I don't think we're going to get number two done today, but we can at least get number one done. I'm going to call this S1 plus S2. And S1 then is minus p squared squared of two p zeros. Zero. All right, so I'm going to write I'm going to write these guys in explicitly. And moreover, I'm going to write them in as as I'm going to. Well, I'm going to write them in completely actually. All right, a p one prime, b p two prime. Integral time order product. And now we've got four integrals. DQ Q1, DQ Q2, DQ Q3. Well, actually, no, I said Q1, Q2, Q1 prime, DQ Q2 prime. It's then 2 pi to the 12th. So I'm just using those formulas over there. 
multiplied with 12, and the square root of two Q zeros. Now we have A dagger Q1 prime e to the I Q1 prime X1. So that's from here. That's this term. The next term is A Q1 e to the minus I Q1 X1. And then there's a phi one, phi X1. And then B Q2 e to the minus I Q2 X2. And then B dagger. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Okay. B dagger. This is my notes. There may be a typo here. No, there isn't. Okay. E to the I Q2 prime X2 phi of X2. And then simply A dagger Q1 B dagger P2. So that's the whole thing for that. All right. Well, right here we've got this creation operator. It commutes with this annihilation operator, but not with this annihilation operator. And although all the initial momenta and final momenta are different, we're integrating over all three momenta in the middle, and so there's a contribution here. And we use the commutation relation there that gives us a delta and a 2 pi cubed and so forth. So that brings this down to 2 pi to the 9th, and it gets rid of this term. So in other words, I'm wondering if I can just do this with the eraser. So this is gone. This is 2 pi to the 9th. I've gotten rid of the Q1 prime integration. This Q1 prime, however, is the same as P1 prime. And so this, so one of the Qs cancels one of the Ps. And moreover, this, since it's a delta function, okay, in other words. We get a delta function from the commutator. So where is the commutator coming from? From this. Well, I unfortunately erased it. That was an A, P1 prime commutator, A dagger, Q1 prime. And this is 2 pi cubed delta of P1 prime minus Q1 prime, 3 vector. But where's the commutator coming from? I only have the product. Oh, well, you can put it in the opposite order and it's zero. Okay, matrix on the zero. Yeah, in other words, zero, A dagger, anything is zero. Okay. Okay, so that means that this Q1 prime is actually a P1 prime. And this guy is gone. Okay, now, you can see that the rest of it is going to work in the same way. For example, this B of Q2. Now, if we move the B through to annihilate this, to cancel this guy and give another commutator, we have the issue of pushing it past the B dagger. Okay, but if, that would give us another commutator. It would give us another delta function. But it would also eliminate two of the four A, B operators that we need to make the thing be non-zero. So if we include this commutator, the thing is zero anyway. In other words, the commutator doesn't contribute. Because over here we said we needed one psi plus, which is to say we needed one A. We needed one of those, which is A 
uh, psi minus, which is a P dagger. A psi plus dagger, we needed an A dagger, and we needed a B. But we need all four operators like that in the middle. And so we lose two with a commutator. So we just move this B straight through and it hits here. Well, then it hits here, picks out a 2 pi cubed, a delta function, and then the Q2 integration goes. But uh, what does Q2 turn out to be? Q2 turns out to be, of course, P2. So this is then P2. And this guy is gone. And we only have a dagger P1 back in here. And we're down to 2 pi to the sixth. And again, we have two of these Qs now are canceling two of those Ps. And now uh, we've got this B dagger then mates with this one, and this A mates with that one. That kicks out 2 pi to the sixth and two delta functions. Am I going too fast? Does anybody have a question? Because we've got three minutes and lots of short work. <laughs> right. Okay. So, so everything is all of a sudden very simple. This, these terms go, these integrations go away, the two pi's go away. These guys completely cancel those guys. So, so the, the, the zeros are gone. This is gone. The T is still there. I don't want to erase that. The integrations here are gone. This is gone. That's gone. And this one is then P1. And this one is P2 prime. And all the operators are gone except for the fives. And so what we've got at this stage is minus G squared integral vacuum time on the product of phi of x1, phi of x2, vacuum, and then these uh, space factors, e the i, p1 prime, x1 minus i, p1, x1, plus minus i, p2, x2, plus i, p2 prime, x2, p4 of x1, p4 of x2. This thing is the mean value of the vacuum of the time-ordered product of a scale field in itself. This is called the Feynman propagator. And it's written as, in pest and Schroeder notation, x1 minus x2, d sub f, and as I'll show on Monday, this is e fourth p over 2 pi to the fourth, i over p squared minus m squared plus i epsilon, e to the minus i p, x1 minus x2. Oh, x minus y. Well, all right, if it's x1 minus x2, then it's that. If that's that, then yeah, okay. All right? So the next step is we just take this integral and substitute it for this mean value in the vacuum of the time order product of the two five fields. So I, again, I have to show you that this is the case Monday. But um, that's then called the Feynman propagator. And when we stick that in, what we get so let me just stick it in there. We get a minus g squared, and then a d fourth p i over two pi to the fourth p squared minus m squared plus i epsilon. You can actually ignore the i epsilon. Okay. And now let's just let me erase this because this is basically the final answer. 
And what happens? Well, you've got two integrations here over x, and both of them give delta functions, four-dimensional delta functions, with two pi's to the four. One of the delta functions says, oh, I left out something. I left out the space factor. This space factor was e to the minus i p x1 minus x2. OK, if we do the d for x1 integration, this gives us minus g squared. It's going to be 2 pi to the fourth, delta fourth, or whatever the coefficient of x1 is. So that's minus p plus p1 prime minus p1. And then everything else, namely d for p i over p squared minus m squared. I'm going to leave out the i x1. It doesn't do anything. And then what's left is e to the minus i p2 minus p2 prime times x2, d for x2. OK, well, the d for p integration just says that p has to equal p1 prime minus p1. And so this becomes p1 prime minus p1 squared minus m squared. The i is there, but the p's are gone. I used up the delta function. And the two pi's to the fourth cancel. And we've just got the d for x2. And I erased something I shouldn't have. Namely, there's an e to the i p, e to the i p x2. And p is p1 prime minus p1 x2. I left that out. Now, if you look at the coefficient of x2, it's effectively p1 prime plus p2 prime minus p1 minus p2. And so that means that the final answer is minus g squared. I left out a typo in there. 2 pi to the fourth, delta fourth of p1 prime plus p2 prime minus p1 minus p2, all times i over p1 prime minus p squared minus m squared. So that's the amplitude of S1. But now you just do the same thing for the second integration. In fact, just to make your lives adventurous, why don't we assign this as a homework problem due Monday? That would be fun for you to do. And so you'll discover the Feynman. You'll discover the rule for what this is. So you just, you just do exactly what I did. All right, and then on Monday, I'll derive this uh, Feynman propagator and maybe also do the propagator for us in one half fields. And, um, uh, and then I'll tell you what the propagator is for spin one. Uh, deriving that is a big deal because of the. Uh, well, it just is. And in fact, you know, it has to be thrown if you skip the quantization. I've heard it to a later chapter where I suppose you also apply the facts and policy. Any questions? Are we, are we done? Um, four minutes over, so yeah, let's stop the table.